So good morning, everybody. Welcome to our machine learning seminar. This is the first seminar this year. So happy new year to everyone. Today we have a pleasure to have a talk from Professor Haralama, Har, sorry, Harala, Harala <laughs> Boss at CQO, uh, Babis from uh, Khalifa University, who will uh, give us a talk uh, on the topic that is already visible on the screen, meaning how can we make clinical predictions when we do not understand everything. Uh, so I'm turning myself into silence and the virtual floor, floor is yours, Babis, please go ahead. Yeah, thanks uh, Jakub for the invitation. Actually, I was pretty happy to receive your invitation. Uh, uh, the, I mean, the last, last year now already and um, so I'm pretty happy to present my work here, uh, which actually it has a provocative title, but this was the main reason why, um, you know, a, a guy like myself wanted to uh, work with uh, machine learning. So in principle, let's just to give you an introduction about myself. Uh, I'm, I'm traditionally a mathematical modeler, but as you will see, mathematical modeling or mechanistic modeling comes up with some shortcomings that I'm going to discuss in a while. And uh, then the, the, the help of uh, data driven or data intensive methods uh, makes everything, uh, you know, it's, it becomes pretty imperative. Uh, and uh, in order to start uh, with, uh, with, with my talk, I will start with my application. I mean, most of my work has been on cancer. And in principle, uh, we, we, were, uh, we are interested in cancer in clinics. Uh, definitely, you know, there are a lot of things uh, that you can do with uh, you can do with cancer. I mean, I, you can check about uh, in vitro models, uh, mice experiments, but really the real deal uh, is cancer in clinics. And here, what I'm going to present you, I'm going to present you at this point one very simple scenario about how cancer in clinics might take place. Where first, you know, if someone suspects that he has a cancer, he goes to the doctor. You visit the doctor and then the doctor, he asks you to make some exams like uh, an MRI or uh, uh, do some uh, biopsy, I mean, if it's possible, uh, or, you know, run some omics for you. And these things, they will take place before the doctor decides about his treatment. After that, treatment will come and, uh, I mean, diagnosis and treatment will come, where treatment typically involves uh, primarily um, a resection, but also it can involve, as you might know, chemotherapy, radiotherapy, immunotherapy nowadays. So name it, it's, it is a multi, there are multiple modalities that can be used. After that, uh, you will have follow-up examinations uh, where uh, the doctors will check you again about the tumor here, you know, uh, it's about the, let's say brain tumor, whatever. Uh, however, this part now, it's, it's where the problem is because Especially if if the if the tumor is in a not a very accessible place like brain, for instance, you cannot examine it too many times. I mean, you know, you might have one, two, three MRIs. That's all. I mean, you know, you're not going to access a lot of times the the the, the tumor itself. So then, with this uh, having these uh, results, that the, the, the doctor has to decide about how to further continue the treatment, but also to predict the survival because this associates completely uh, with uh, what the treatment would be. And this is a very tricky part. And why it's a tricky part? So as you might saw here, you know, in all this timeline, the, the doctor took data from the tumor just a few times. So there are these three challenges that they are really uh, um, engaged or associated with uh, tumor uh, cancer in clinics. So first of all, when we talk about all the time, we talk about uh, big data and things like that, but in clinic, this is not a relevant problem. In principle, in clinic, you have sparse data and time. So the point is that, you know, uh, as I said, I mean, if you have a tumor, for instance, in your brain, uh, most likely you might have two MRI scans, not more. I mean, one before and one after the, the treatment. Um, also, this, so, so, so temporally wise, these are pretty sparse. On the other hand, this data, they can be noisy. I mean, we know that. But not only that, they are snapshots in time. So, you know, you don't really uh, have dynamic data. You don't have kinetics here. So uh, even if I have a model that uh, is, you know, like uh, it regards uh, kinetics, uh, I cannot really do much because I don't have a time series of the, of the, uh, of the data. 
And last but not least, uh, the biological mechanisms are partial known. I mean, this is kind of known here that every day you listen to the news that a new mechanism or something new related to tumor has been discovered. Especially, you know, when we talk about immune system, which it's the big, uh, it's a very big uh, field in immunology, and still there are so many open questions. Uh, this is something that, uh, you know, th th this is something that is very valid. So the question here is, uh, how can we connect the dots? And in order to motivate you a bit, I'm going to go somewhere that uh, people might uh, uh, feel more comfortable. And I'm going, so I was telling you that, you know, we have mainly, for instance, images as a source of data. And, you know, the images here, as in the biopsy, they show cells. So think about that your cells, they are football players. So in this case, what I'm going to show you, I'm going to show you images or uh, that uh, they, they are going to come, for instance, from the past. And then you have to make, or from the future, I mean, uh, of, of, you know, a football game. And then you have to diagnose, which means you have to guess what's the past. And on the other, the other side, if I give you something from the past, you have to make a prognosis, which means you have to predict what's happening in the future. So first of all, if I show you this image, uh, <clears throat> what can one think, I mean, happened before? So, you know, what's the diagnosis here, let's say? Uh, does anyone want to make a try? You know, it, actually, it's pretty obvious that, you know, these guys, they're celebrating something. Yeah? And then, uh, in principle, they are, they're, they're, celebrating, uh, they're celebrating a goal. So, here, you know, just to, for the, uh, ah, actually, I have to change that. Let me put the arrow. Uh, you know, here you can see that uh, this is indeed coming from, uh, it's a celebration from a goal. And uh, definitely, you know, whoever said that this is a goal celebration, he was, uh, he was right. Actually, this comes also from my favorite team in Greece. <laughs> so that's why it's a very, uh, it has a meaning for me. <laughs> so in principle, uh, as I said, I mean, this, if your diagnosis was a goal, then, then that, was, uh, that was a very correct uh, thing. And as we see, this is exactly the snapshot. Now, uh, let's go to the next one. So you see this image here. So this image, you see a, pe pe a, pe a person crying. I mean, a player is crying. So somehow, you know, and someone tries to consolidate him. So what would you think here? I mean, you would think something negative happened. Something, they lost uh, the goal, they lost a the penalty, you know, something uh, bad. Uh, uh, in principle, this is wrong. Because in this case, what it happened, it was, again, they, they scored a goal. They scored a goal, but uh, because of uh, the sentimental, uh, let's say, uh, because of the emotions that time, you know, this player broke out. So it's a kind of, you know, in this case, if you would have said this was a kind of sad event here, that was kind of wrong. So the image here told us a wrong story, right? So that's mainly, you know, what I'm trying to convince you in this case. Uh, yeah, so that's the proof. So now let's see the next image. So now let's try the vice versa. Let's make a prognosis where in principle, uh, we, we try from this image to predict what happens next. Okay, so, you know, I'm not going to go too far away. I'm going to say, you know, what's happened here. So you see, uh, you see here the, the goal uh, that uh, the ball uh, went into the, uh, behind the line. So most likely one could guess, yeah, this was a goal and the next image would be going for a kickoff. Unfortunately, that's again not the case because uh, it was actually this ghost goal between uh, England and Germany uh, where Lampard here, he's like uh, get it, driven crazy because this goal didn't count. So again, uh, what I want to say is that, you know, having just this image doesn't tell us much about what is going to happen in the future. So in principle here, of course, you know, this is a fun analogy at, this, at the same day, but uh, what I want to say is that images, static snapshots in time, typically, or a lot of times they don't tell us the truth or what we want to know. So what is the, what's, the, what's the underlying approach in all of my work? Or my work, it's actually trying to understand what's the impact of cell decision making of, uh, uh, in, in, uh, in, in the progression of uh, cancer. So going back to the cells now, if we assume that, you know, you have a central cell here and this cell is interacting with a bunch of other entities, uh, which can be uh, other immune cells or other types of cell uh, or epithelial cells or whatever, you know, 
and this is a cancer cell, let's say, uh, this guy, after the interactions, he might make a decision. So you see he receives signals, he might take a decision and change its behavior, change its phenotype. We call it phenotype change. Uh, so if it does this, uh, then, um, then, then, then you will have a new situation where this guy, he will going to send new signals or he's going to interact in a new way with the surrounding. And definitely then we will have a cycle, this vicious cycle here, where it's actually, it's a dialogue between, this dynamic dialogue between cells. And uh, as you see here with the, the microenvironment, as you see here, this is kind of complex because also you don't have a single cell in, in, the, in, your, in your system, you have multiple cells. So you have multiple instances of these dynamic dialogues. And this is the definition of complex systems and by in mathematics, what uh, complex systems means, it means emergent behavior or emergent organizational structures. So, and this is actually a way that we like to see uh, the, oh, what happened here? A little bit, I think my computer, hopefully, oh, sorry. I think somehow my computer crashed. Give me a second. Yeah, okay. No problem. Take your time. <laughs> Hopefully, uh, it's going to. I don't know why it's doing that. It's changed its phenotype. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> but not in a nice way. <laughs> not in the way that I would expect it to. Okay. have a crash again. So let me share it. Okay, can you see my screen? Yes, we are back on uh, your your presentation, yes, it's it's visible now. Okay. So I don't want to load this slide again because I don't. Maybe this is the source of the problem. So I'm going to load the next one. Uh, but just I want to do, you know, uh, it, it, since I was finalizing the slide at this point, I want to say that you know this is the way that we are looking uh, at the cancer at this point. That's an emergent behavior of uh, of cell interactions, and in principle, this is actually not a very new thing. This is something that already, you know, this guy Smithers in 1962 already he was conceiving the concept of uh, these uh, interactions between cells, and he was saying that cancer is no more a disease of cells than traffic jam is a disease of cars. A lifetime study of internal combustion engine would not help anyone to understand our traffic problems. So now I can go back to the full screen, uh, and uh, so now. The idea is, okay, uh, since uh, we had uh, this uh, problem here and we want to make something computational, one very naive idea would have been, uh, let's put everything together, you know, in a, in a big algorithm and actually to, to, to predict cancer, cancer behavior. And this is something that uh, already IBM, uh, you know, tried that. And in principle, they tried uh, with this program, the IBM Watson, where uh, they they took the data from uh, very big um, uh, hospitals like uh, Memorial Sloan Catering uh, Cancer Center in New York or MD Anderson or Mount Sinai. And then get the, I mean, more actually. And they put all this data into the computer and uh, in the machine learning actually uh, system uh, in order. And they hoped that they will have the best treatment possible for this type of cancers. But the point is that this failed. Actually, we don't know why it really failed, and we can guess on because you know there was never a report about that, or I, at least I don't know it. I didn't find it, and you can imagine this was a kind of proprietary system. So I, IBM, there was never a peer review, so IBM never put out anything, uh, um, anything uh, on, on 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 the public. Uh, but what I can guess why it failed was the following: this could have been rather expected. So in principle, what is 
where it's fairly known like 20 years ago is this no freelance theorems. And this was mainly for optimization. Uh, and this was in 1997, where actually people were trying to uh, build general purpose black box optimization algorithms. So they were saying, okay, let's, you know, it doesn't matter the optimization problem, it doesn't matter the context, give me the problem and I will make an optimizer. And then in this paper, they were proving that actually this was not possible unless you were incorporating problem specific knowledge into the, uh, into the algorithm. And this is actually <clears throat> where the whole thing is coming. So having data crunching methods, yeah, they're nice, but definitely they need some context. And actually this has been already uh, something that we need to, 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 to do. I mean, you know, we need to integrate biological uh, knowledge in the algorithms or make biologically informed algorithms. And, but again, the question is how to do that, okay? There are a lot of ways to do that. I mean, maybe, you know, you know about Bayesian networks, so that's a classical way, a classical guess, but honestly speaking, they, they are different approaches and I will present you one like that. And um, here actually is where the key problem for biomedicine comes. So we want to predict things about complex diseases that we don't know the underlying mechanism or even the underlying the fully the underlying biology because actually if you we knew fully the underlying biology most likely we would have made uh, mechanistic models and in this case now this is actually something that you might have seen many times this is a space time the spatial temporal scales and then you see in biology you have things that they are inside the cell you have here the cell behavior you have uh, the cell inter cell cell interactions uh, this gives rise to an emerging behavior to different tissues and when tissues are interacting they give uh, rise to different organs and the organ system gives rise to the human being or whatever individual you would like to study. So the distribution of knowledge along these scales is something like that. I mean this is of course a very crude uh, representation. It's not really, uh, this curve is not really calculated. It's just a concept. But the point is that where we know the most biology is around here in these mesoscopic scales. So typically here in these mesoscopic scales, this has been studied uh, ages by biologists where they put under the microscope cells and they were observing their behavior. Uh, but, but of course, recently we have a lot of knowledge gained here, right? But still, it's not enough. We don't know everything. A lot of times when people, you ask people, what is the molecular mechanisms underlying the phenomenon, they will tell you, okay, we don't know, most likely we don't know all the mechanisms. So the idea here is, and, and how we tackle this, we are building mechanistic models. So this knowledge, actually, this is what we, we know the most, and this is what we have more experience. And here is what we have done until now, we were building models that they were modeling the growth rates, the interactions of cells, and these dynamic models they had some predictable, some uh, uh, some potential to predict uh, behaviors, but still, as I said, I mean there are a lot of things that we don't know. So, to go to the menu of my talk, really, because that thing now was the prelude, uh, the clinical predictions uh, that uh, we need to do actually is we have to to move our own scales. So what I'm going to show you is I'm going to show you actually a bottom-up approach first. I mean uh, where <clears throat> I'm going to focus on cancer cell plasticity. I'm going to show you what it means by that. And then I'm going to show you uh, a very shortly, because this is not a very, uh, let's say, this is not a completely ready uh, approach, but I will give you the glimpse of that. Uh, when we, how we can treat when we have partial knowledge at the cellular level and then the, how, and how to overcome it. So this is a kind of theory that I'm trying to develop which is called least microenvironmental uncertainty principle. But I'm going to go to that later. later. But this is a bottom-up approach. And on the other hand, I can show you, I will show you also another top-down approach that we have developed where we don't have the full knowledge in the clinics, as you might have seen already. And there uh, we have developed a combination of machine learning and, uh, and uh, a Bayesian combination of machine learning and, uh, and mechanistic modeling. So let me go to, 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 to the main thing. So I'm going to set up now the main problem that we had. Uh, or, you know, this is actually my oldest problem that I was working on, and I was working on cancer cell plasticity, but actually I was working on a very specific problem of cancer cell plasticity, which is called migration proliferation plasticity, or go or grow. So simply, what is, I'm not going to go too deep into these details, but I have to set up the stage for that. Uh, 
We have here, uh, you know, we have seen that in brain tumors or in other tumors, I will show you afterwards. What we see here is that there is a migration proliferation dichotomy. So the cells, they tend to, mo to proliferate more and migrate less or the vice versa. So you can think of this as a kind of uh, energy conservation uh, mechanism where the cells read their microenvironment and according to the microenvironmental conditions, they change either to proliferative, so it means duplicating phenotypes or uh, migratory phenotypes. So this actually, uh, it's not a particular thing for uh, cancer cells. Actually, it has been observed in gliomas, but it has been observed also in breast cancer, uh, for melanoma, some people claim, but also in uh, development, uh, they have seen that uh, when cells, they are uh, moving, they go to the cell cycle arrest, which means uh, they just stop dividing, uh, or when they divide, they don't move. So somehow, you know, you can see this behavior that pertains, uh, pertains the whole spectrum of biology. So here we have done a model, with, I'm not going to go to the details, but actually the, 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 this model was a cellular automaton model, and there are multiple works of mine on that, but I'm just showing you here one of them, uh, where actually the, the model was very simple, cells were interacting together, and uh, then the, the cells, they had two phenotypes, one was resting, where it was able to proliferate, and then the other was migratory, and then there was a transition probability between the two states, uh, and of course there was a small probability to, to die. Uh, then uh, this was played out, all these uh, dynamics that were played out in a lattice, and uh, what we have assumed actually, we made two assumptions for these transition probabilities, so this transition probability RS is when the cells, they decide to go from the migratory or moving state to the resting state. And you can make two different assumptions. One, one, the first assumption is that, by the way, can you see my cursor when I move it or not? Yes, I can see it, I guess. Uh, oh, you can see it. Okay, good. So you see the cursor. Under, I can see it. Oh, okay, good, good. Just, uh, I was... Uh, okay, so then you can, so the first selection is you have this, this, attractive, this attractive switching functions where the, this depends on the local cell density. So the more dense, the, the denser locally the, the neighborhood it is, then the cells, they want to stay there and start proliferating. When for low density areas, the cells, they like to move out. On the other hand, you have what we call a repulsive switching function, where the cells, they are kind of antisocial, and when they find out a lot of uh, colleagues here, they just want to move up and to move away. So, for instance, you know, to find more free space. And then when they find enough free space, then they become resting and they start proliferating. So, interestingly, most of the tumors, they are like in this regime, I mean, high, ag very aggressive tumors, they are more or less here, but they are, we speculate that they are, they, they low, low grades, uh, they can be here. And interestingly, uh, this imposes, actually, uh, if you calculate the extinction probability of such uh, tumor, uh, we you can find out the, an allay effect. So allay effect, it doesn't mean anything else than, uh, than a bistability in the population dynamics where the, there is a threshold density, where above that cell, uh, the, the colony grows to a full-grown tumor, or below that, this goes extinct. And interestingly, this is the probability of uh, extinction having, and, and here on the x-axis you have the density, so if we go to this middle ground, uh, there is an interesting phenomenon, we can set up two simulations exactly identical, and these identical simulations, uh, just under the stochasticity or the noise, uh, one can, go, can grow, this one will grow, but this one will go extinct. So this was actually at the verge of, of the uh, basin of, attractor, of attraction of the system. So, as you might have seen here, you know, this phenomenon actually it has an impact on tumors. Uh, as I said, when you have this, more, this kind of case, this repulsive case, you have monostability, you don't have any more this bistability, so tumors always grow, and this is kind of true for very high grades. But, uh, interestingly, you know, this was a kind of uh, game model that we thought, okay, maybe it doesn't have too much of a truth, but in principle, there was some experimental evidences uh, just two years after our publication where uh, they, the, the people made experiments with glioblastoma cells, which actually it's a great for, it's a most aggressive tumor. And even in this most aggressive tumor, what they found out, they found out there exists a weak allay effect. Which, what it means, in the strong allay effect, as you see here, these are, let's say, the nucleine. Uh, so here below this threshold, uh, density threshold, you have 
negative growth rates or actually die, the, 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 the colony dies and here it grows. But in the Guical effect, what is happening is you have a kind of, uh, the, I mean, the, the, for low uh, densities, the growth rate approaches to zero, right? So in principle, this, this LA effect, it's even apparent in the uh, high grade humors. And interestingly, now, since you, one can come here and say, okay, you know, you just modeled humor cells, there are so many other things in, the, in like real life, then you can make even a, a complicated model. So I'm not going to go into the details of this model, but uh, actually I'm going, this is uh, the interesting thing is you have here oxygen that's produced by vasculature, and we know that oxygen fits tumor cells, uh, but in the lack of oxygen, tumor cells, they create their own vasculature. So this is, you know, a kind of positive feedback loop, but then there is a negative feedback loop where when you increase the density, the cells, they are crushing the vasculature, right? So this I can write in a system of ODEs. I'm not going to go into the details of that, but the interesting thing is that it has really an impact on if I try to make different uh, therapeutic modalities. So for instance, here is the native diffusion rate and proliferation rate of cells. And you will see here that uh, uh, if I uh, influence, let's say, their, uh, if I influence their diffusivity and proliferation, uh, they, they, they have different uh, speeds. So actually what's called speed is uh, how fast the tumor grows and the width actually is the infiltration zone where it means how much the tumor infiltrates into the neighboring healthy tissue. So here you have fast growing tumors, but they grow like a ball, where here you have like a bit of stealth tumors, they grow, they seem to grow smaller, but you see only the tip of the iceberg. And then the other cells, they are in a low density and they are not detectable by MRI or whatever other imaging modalities. So, in, and in principle, the interesting thing, as I said here, is like, if I use two different approaches, one is to kill the vessels or to improve the vessels in the tumor, uh, you will see that we have, we can go to these two different behaviors. So to make a long story short is these mechanisms that we have modeled, they have severe implications in the therapy. However, we don't know everything. Okay. The, what, even if I made a pretty complex model here, still, it's not everything. I mean, it's, there are no, uh, there are no mechanics here. There are no immune cells. So how can we deal with that? And uh, so for instance, and, and the question is, uh, how can we even include data that we don't, we're not able to model? So here I'm going to go to the first solution, which actually, as I said, this it's not a ready solution, but it's an idea that we are developing currently in much simpler systems than the tumor. But I'm going to give you the idea. So this is a funded project that they had from uh, Volkswagen, uh, where we view cells, as I said, I'm interested in the cell decision making, and we view cells as Bayesian decision makers. So the cells, they have internal states. So here the internal state before it was uh, it, it was uh, a kind of uh, binary, either proliferative or migratory. And then you have external states, which can be, you know, either oxygen or, den or local cell density. Uh, and then uh, they influence the behavior of one to each other. And then what we assume is that uh, the tumors, the, the, the cells, they try to, to define the, the posterior probability of X by measuring Y. And in principle, this probability here, this empiric uh, distribution here is actually the sampling, the microenvironmental sampling or sensing that it takes place in the in the tumor cell, in the microenvironment of the cell. And but interestingly, this is a kind of expensive, okay, because the cell needs to uh, to produce uh, proteins, needs to do things in order to sense the microenvironment. So another thing that the cell has is the prior peaks, where in principle this is a kind of uh, uh, this is a kind of very um, in, uh, intuitive thing that the cell has its own prejudice about its own microenvironment. And how is that? By encoding in, 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 in his DNA. So in principle, this is kind of intrinsic, let's say, uh, uh, I mean, this is the, the, the bias that the cell has to do something. And this is what it gets updated by measuring the microenvironment. So what we postulated here is this, uh, LOIP or least the environmental uncertain principle where the cells build optimal priors that allow them to infer the microenvironment in an energetically efficient manner. And this can be formulated as a maximum entropy principle where actually the constraint here for the, uh, for the internal variables where the constraint here, the main constraint is the mutual information between the microenvironment and the, uh, and the 
determined states. And of course, here, the interesting thing is if you make it in this way, you can constrain the problem by other types of knowledge that you have. I mean, you know, if you have a model for pathways, you can integrate it in your in, 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 in the constraints of the uh, uh, maximum entropy problem. So to go back, we have used this principle to, uh, okay, here, some cells. So we have used this principle to uh, model the migration proliferation plasticity. And as I said, we had here this binary thing that uh, zero was resting and one was motile. This is exactly the same model as before, but now the transition probabilities, we didn't uh, use the transition probabilities we used here, but we used that the uh, change of the phenotype, it comes from this change in the entropy uh, of the micro environment here, or the change of the information between uh, if, so if a cell decides to become zero or resting, then we, this will induce a change in the, uh, in the information of the micro environment. And this is the complementary of that. So interestingly, uh, if we do this thing, this bistability still emerges. So this alpha effect that we saw still emerges, but also we have monostability in all these things it depends on this beta parameter where actually uh, it's uh, the sensitivity, let's say, of uh, uh, actually it's the Lagrange multiplier here. Uh, and not only that, also the, the, the system can exhibit a pattern formation. As I said, this, this is a concept still, so it's far away from clinical application. I'm, uh, as I gave it you, uh, just a kind of thing to see what approach can, other approaches can happen. But now I'm going to show you maybe what is the most relevant here, which is the uh, what is close to the, what we can use close to the clinics. And the idea, as I, I said before, is we would like to integrate biological knowledge in the form of mechanistic models. So in principle, this is something that, uh, you know, it's not very, uh, it's kind of intuitive uh, because, okay, if you don't know how to model things, you might use machine learning. But if you know how to model things, you can write equations. I mean, you saw some equations that I wrote before. And what we want to know to, to do here is to harness, let's say, in a Bayesian matter to create intelligent priors uh, that come from these uh, mechanistic predictions. And uh, this will have the form, uh, this form. So let's assume Y is the outputs of the, of a model, uh, oh, sorry, of the, uh, the clinical outputs we're interested in. For instance, let's say how fast the tumor grows or how, what is the length of the infiltration zone. And then this XM is the variables that I can model and XU is the variables that I cannot model. And then we can see that this becomes, uh, this posterior here, they can, under some mild assumptions, uh, they can become, uh, they can be decomposed by the posterior of the model predictions and the posterior of uh, the machine learning where the unmodelable are coming. I'm going to show you a bit of some details. Uh, so here, this is the assumption actually, that when you have this kind of uh, joint probability, you can decompose it uh, in, this, in this way, okay? so. Here, of course, you can say that uh, there you, this bears, uh, this introduced some errors, but you know, we can, we try to live with them at this point. So what is the idea behind? This is the main concept here. Uh, this is what we have published uh, last year. So what we have done, we had, uh, uh, we, we assume there is uh, a new patient coming to the clinics. So uh, here we have three uh, uh, variables. Uh, that I have shown you before, C is the tumor density, N is the, uh, is the oxygen, uh, let's say, um, uh, concentration, the average oxygen concentration in the, tumor, uh, in the tumor, and V is the vasculature. I mean, I have shown you before that these three variables, they interact together, right? And um, I can write even a model for that. But the problem is, what I can measure typically is this C. This is actually what you can measure in the patient, right? This C, you make an MRI and you can estimate it. But there is no way, or there actually there are ways like uh, perfusion imaging uh, that people can estimate, let's say something about vasculature or the oxygen distribution, but this is not state of the art. It's not the standard of care. Uh, however, uh, what we can assume here is that um, what, uh, even if you have a tumor, uh, a, a guy here, but for this C actually, I will assume that I can write always a model, okay? Uh, and uh, for uh, this uh, model, uh, I can make some predictions. And for the rest of them, 
I will assume that they had some data from previous patients, you know? So maybe from this patient, I don't have these guys here, but I have from this patient, and actually, I don't know how to integrate them in my model. So here with the gray box, these variables, I don't know how to integrate them in this model. So, okay, I, I mean, I have done a model before, but in principle, uh, let's assume I cannot integrate them because this is actually a synthetic problem what I'm going to show you here. So, uh, so I have these unmodelable variables, but still these unmodelable variables, let's assume that we can measure them. And then in this, uh, in this uh, box here, I have the clinical outcomes. These are the whys, okay? So for each patients, uh, for N patients, I can have this data set. And then what I can do is write a model for C, uh, make some predictions, and then for the other two variables, use some kind of machine learning. Here we have the made the kind of density estimation uh, algorithm, but here you can use your uh, beloved uh, regression algorithm. And then you see here for these uh, two, uh, for these two um, observable, which actually, as I said, is the tumor speed, which is actually how fast the tumor moves, and the tumor infiltration zone, which is actually what I it's observable. Uh, what is not observable in an MRI for a tumor, and this is actually uh, what I can have, uh, what, what I get from the non-modelable uh, predictions. And then what you do is you combine them in this, uh, in this uh, Bayesian way, and, and as you can see here, this uh, distribution somehow selects the right mode uh, of, the, of the model predictions, and then this is actually what we will call uh, what we will call a prediction. So now let's see it in practice. Uh, so we have, we made here some uh, glioblastoma synthetic data. So actually we used our virtual reality model, which is actually what I have shown you before. This complex model with the three PDEs, where it involves uh, C, N, and V, which is actually tumor density, um, uh, oxygen, and vasculature. And then I can assume now that I'm using a model. And this model actually is just a simplification of the first equation, okay? So this is just a physical Kolmogorov equation, which actually just models C. So in the model, let's assume, you know, I developed a model and since I know, and this is actually, as I said, my virtual reality, uh, in the models, typically we can harness the predictive, uh, the predictive uh, power of just few, a handful of, uh, of uh, how's it called? Uh, of uh, variables. And then if I use this simple model now, then I can, here is, I'm showing how I'm constructing actually my, uh, uh, my uh, cohort of patients. So we have simulated this big model in order to create here a cohort of patients where these patients, they have uh, a time, a clinical presentation time. And then we can say that, uh, you know, uh, we want to predict after time P, right? And then we go to predict the infiltration width and the tumor mass. That's the two things. So now, as I said before, uh, we have done this full process. We run this full model, uh, which we call BAM, which means just the uh, Bayesian uh, mechanistic modeling and machine learning combination. And, uh, and then the point is that uh, uh, this is exactly what the example that I showed you before, that this uh, data-driven distribution selects somehow the correct uh, uh, the correct mode, and in principle, in this case, where you are going to see the red point, the red point is my real uh, value for this patient, and if I was selecting the mean or the median of this distribution, the, it would have been this black point. And as you see here, only the model, it doesn't do a good job, I mean, it, it divides a lot. But if I use my data-driven uh, distribution, then I will select you know, this mode, and then you see this dark point comes very close to the red point, which means I improved a lot the error. So we made some uh, metric. So this is actually uh, the, uh, here is uh, the distance, let's say, between uh, the model and the synthetic reality. And uh, what we have done, we measured actually the, 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 this metric, I mean, the, the distance from the real error, uh, for predictions for 12 months and for 24 months. With blue, you see when we apply the full uh, BAM method, and uh, so this is uh, SI is uh, actually uh, the this actually, no, sorry, this is the, the, uh, the, the with, with SI is when, when the synthetic reality is, 
is less, I mean, the distance from the synthetic reality is less than the distance from the model. So here, actually, with uh, yellow, the model performs better than the full BAM uh, model. But then, as you see, the prediction time increases, then we have, let's say, much better predictions uh, than the model alone. And here, SD is when the, they are the same, you know, the model and the full, uh, and the full, uh, the full BAM uh, uh, algorithm. And what, but when we go, interestingly, when we go to 24 days, uh, 24 months, sorry, then the predictions, they are always better uh, from the BAM algorithm. So the model cannot predict more than three months in principle. I mean, it's not very good. And this is, you know, something that puzzled us at the beginning because we were expecting for lower times, we can have better predictions than for longer times. But actually, this is actually where is the secret. This comes to the limitation of the, of the algorithm. And the limitation of the algorithm comes to the fact that in order, so here, these are, this is the distribution, the data-driven distribution coming from the unmodelable. And as you see here, when we use this synthetic reality, you see that this, uh, uh, this distribution evolves in time and only stabilizes somehow after 18 to 24, to 24 months. You see, before it's very, uh, it's very much different. So here you arrive to a kind of quasi steady state of that. So in principle, in order this uh, method to work as we have set it up now, it needs to have unmodelable data that they are not changing too much in time. So that's the first limitation of the model. The second limitation is that the job that, so here red is the, so this is D and B, they are the diffusion and the proliferation rate of the, of the tumor. Um, uh, and uh, for different predictions in different times, one month, three months, up to 12 months. And you see here, when we go to the extremities of the parameter space, the algorithm doesn't do a very good job. So in principle, uh, outliers can be challenged. So that was the synthetic data. In principle, we knew here everything, but this is not the case when you don't know everything. And I'm going to show you two, uh, two cases on real data, and I'm going to finish. Uh, so one is on chronic lymphocytic leukemia where actually we took data from literature from this paper and and here we have uh, had 19 patients so it was not too many patients but as you see here these guys they were pay measuring uh let's say the they had apart from other demographic data they were measuring uh, how much was the tumor of uh, so he, this this is a, this is actually a blood tumor leads leukemia so they were measuring how much blood, uh, tumor was in the blood by dyeing the, the cells, and then they were measuring some CD338 uh, or some other um, some other mutations here. Uh, also, they had the birth rate of the tumor cells. So somehow we use this data, and we fit, set it up a model, a very simple model. Actually, I'm not, I don't have time to set up the model, but the model just it's just a population model that has growth of the tumor cells inside the bone marrow, and then you have some spillover in the blood. That's actually the model. Uh, and then it mod just models only the density of tumor cells in the blood. Uh, where they are modelable, so they are uh, two, three models, three uh, variables that they are related with immune system, uh, the white blood cells, the EG, uh, the H, and Z38, 38, and then the H. And then these ones, since we couldn't write a model, we were using machine learning here. And then we were using our BAM, so actually the Bayesian way of combining things. And um, to make, uh, and, it, and interestingly, you see here that when we used increasingly more unmodelable variables, the, the mean square error of the prediction was decaying. Okay, and this is actually another thing. I mean, you know, uh, another take home message here that you have to have enough unmodelable variables, otherwise, you know, your predictions can be as bad as your model. Uh, on the other hand, uh, as you see here, uh, the using more and more uh, uh, these variables, this is the distribution of the data derived PDF. And then as you see for the certain patient, this red line is the true uh, value of this of the system. And as you see here, this goes closer and closer to the true value, including more and more variables. So it, it pays off to have uh, data. Now, that's the last case I'm going to show. The, the last, we tested the algorithm on ovarian cancer. And again, this was published data. So these ovarian cancers, usually they had, uh, they, they, they undergo some treatment, uh, some chemotherapy treatment. They were shrinking a bit, then they were removed with surgery. And after surgery, you had another adjuvant treatment uh, where uh, 
chemotherapy treatment uh, to hope that you will eliminate the tumor, but a lot of these tumors, they regrew. Okay, so what they were interested here, these guys, they were interested in tumor, sorry, in uh, time to relapse. Okay, so this is, this is how is the problem called time to relapse. And as I said, you had these different modalities. So here, this was the data set we had. Actually, the variables, we had tumor uh, density that we can model, but uh, we had not too many variables, unmodelable variables in this case. And these unmodelable variables, typically, we took the age. That was the only one. So here, we had just one unmodelable variable, the age, and we had one modelable variable, which is, was actually the uh, time to relapse, but actually time to relapse was coming from a model that it was assuming tumor uh, population, tumor, tumor population dynamics. So, and this is actually a solution for that. So this is a tumor to relapse, which actually gamma, it was the proliferation rate, and this ti, ti, tau, TR is the resection time, and um, this is the time, uh, the, the time scale of death. So uh, using now the model, and we used here a very simple model that it was assuming sensitive and resistant cells. So sensitive cells, they were pretty, means that they were killed much more when you were applying, uh, when you were applying uh, chemotherapy. But on the other hand, we know that there is a uh, there is a transfer rate from sensitive to the resistant. So se when you apply a therapy to the tumor, the cells tend to become more resistant. So they don't. So if you apply a therapy, they are not dying as much as the sensitive cells. So this was our very simple model, and from this very simple model, we were calculating actually the time to relapse. And to make a long story short, actually, we used here uh, again our method. So this blue is the mean square error coming from the uh, using only the model. This red comes using only the unmodelable data, and this using the combination. And as you see here, typically this was when we had improvement in the predictions. So if the model was pro uh, producing this blue distributions and red was the reality, the truth uh, of, uh, of the problem. Uh, then you see here, introducing the data distribution, you, the, the model was calculating, you know, this kind of intermediate distribution where it was more or less, at most, most cases, close to the real tumor. So to finalize it, definitely, you know, I'm not claiming that, you know, this method we produce is the best. Still, you know, there are a lot of, uh, edges that you can touch it and improve it. But why we have done this was the following way. As I said here, and this is, all, this is my final uh, slide, um, I'm, I'm show you again a conceptual slide of here we, in the x-axis we have what we call biophysical uh, mechanism knowledge where you, you, you can have high to low and then here is model interpretability. So if you have a lot of biophysical knowledge then please go on and make your best me uh, mechanistic model. And since this is highly interpretable, this is the best case scenario, okay, right? I mean, this is, although still you will have problems in calibrating the parameters, that's another que question, but you know, this is what you should do. If you have low knowledge and low, and you don't care about the model interpretability, machine learning should do the job. But what I was presenting here in both cases, we have this intermediate ground where partial knowledge exists and it gives you also some kind of interpretability, better interpretability than the sole machine learning uh, case. And uh, we hope that using or evolving these methodologies further, we can get something not only nice predictions, but also um, uh, addressing the problem of how to improve therapies. So that's all, sorry if I exceeded my time. Uh, these are the persons that uh, worked on these uh, projects. Uh, Pietro, which is not actually he, he went also to uh, to industry now. Uh, Simos is with me. Juan Carlos, he's in industry, and Arnab is in Montreal. And uh, yeah, I would like to stop here. Thank you, and uh, I'm open to questions. Thank you, Babis, uh, for a very nice presentation. It took longer than usual, but uh, yeah, sorry about that. Yeah, <laughs> we are we are flexible, as I mentioned to you in the, my email. Just take uh, the time that you need to present your topic. Uh, in a way that you like to present it. So thank you so much. We have a short uh, time for discussion, but uh, uh, we can open up the question part. Uh, I, I can maybe start with a, a question waiting for another one, people, other people who yeah. want to ask question. Uh, just a general question. Uh, correct me if I'm wrong. Uh, can we classify your approach as uh, the one 
that creates a pre-trained probabilistic model based on in silico data, and then use the measured real data to update the model in a Bayesian man manner. Is it the, the approach that you uh, um, actually, apply, or it is a bit different than that? Mm -hmm. Yeah, thanks for your question. Actually, the idea is that in both cases, you are using data. So as I said, I mean, let me go back to the conceptual scheme here. Uh, <clears throat> even when we are doing a model, we will use some part of the data. But the problem is the model just use a handful. I mean, you know, you make cherry picking, I mean, the, from the mechanism that you understand. So therefore, uh, you use the model, you use part of the data to make some prediction from the model. And then, of course, the rest of them, you use a machine learning algorithm to crunch them. And then you try to correct one to each other, I mean, with this Bayesian way. So, uh, <clears throat> so in principle, yeah, you can see it as correcting the model as one way. But on the other hand, you can see how, how I can correct the, the machine learning algorithm. On, but the only problem is in the machine learning, algor machine learning algorithm, I don't use the, this variable that I have used for the model. That's the only difference of that. I mean, for the model, I have used some variables and the rest of them, I have used them to train my machine learning algorithm. My I, see, algorithm. I see, okay. I mean, you could, but you could do that. I mean, this could be an alternative approach, but it's not exactly what I was describing here. Mm -hmm. So, so the inputs to your model are a bit different, depending whether yes, you have the part, mechanistic so model part, or... Go on, Jago. Uh, so, so the, the inputs to your models, to, 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 to models are a bit different, right? This is what yes, you right. wanted to mention. Okay. Okay, I can see. Uh, I can see no questions from the audience. Actually, also another natural question would be how it's related with pins. You know, that's another. Yes, uh, this this also what came to my mind that it is somehow yeah, and, uh, very, very and resembles about... the the idea. Yes, things. exactly. In principle, Although here, I think you don't include the uh, the exactly. physics into the machine learning model directly, right? It is implicit. yeah, and, and also in pins in the classical formulation of the pins, you have the data, you have the machine learning producing something, and then you were like fact checking the predictions of uh, this uh, according to the physics. The difference is that here there are two th two things that they are different. In physics, actually, the models are more established, so somehow you know you are more sure that this is kind of uh, even correcting what the artifacts of a neural network could be. But on the other hand, you could think that your loss function is, uh, it's a kind, I mean, if I think these are a kind of Gaussians, you know, you could think that this is the loss function. It pre represents a bit predictions from model uh, to and, and the machine learning. But the problem is here, you know, the, the machine learning feeds to the model, where in my case, directly raw data fit some of them fit the uh, feed the the, the 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 model, and some of them feed the machine learning algorithm. So it's not I exactly see. the same. Mm -hmm. uh, I can see Stefan Bordas has yeah. switched on the mic and video. Please go ahead. Hello. Good, good morning. Thanks for the talk. It was Hi. Really cool. Um, I, I don't know if I understood everything about problem. No, I know I did not understand everything. Uh, and I would have love to ask something. Um, what is your experience in merging data that comes from uh, in silico measurement and uh, data that comes from physical experiments? Oh, <coughs> that's uh, so you. Okay, your your question is a very interesting thing because it's also a big discussion, uh, for instance, in uh, data augmentation. Am I right? That uh... Uh, I don't know. I mean, I was thinking of cases where you could simulate with some sort of model and parameters, and then you could also measure some the same system. 
with whatever model and whatever parameter could be describing it, but we don't know. And then trying to uh, to teach a machine learning algorithm like an artificial neural network, both using data that comes from simulations and data that comes from actual experiments of the same problem. Yeah, right. I mean, I, I actually uh, I faced the problem a bit in. Uh, I, mean, I will tell you my experience because I don't know exactly you know everything. But uh, my experience was mostly on data augmentation. So, because typically in medical data sets, you don't have a lot of data. I mean, you don't have a lot of patients. And that's actually a kind of thing that, uh, you know, if you go to a doctor, he might have uh, patients at the orders of tenths or uh, 10 to the power two, but, you know, not more than that. I mean, you never have uh, thousands of patients unless you work with a clinical trial. There it's a good case, actually, uh, because you have enough data. Uh, but given the variability of the patients can be different. So the question here was a lot of times if we don't have if we don't have the data uh, enough data, how can we augment the data set in order to to make that to make it better? So one idea was uh, and we have played with that a bit to fit a model to the existing data and then produce more data and then use a more powerful machine learning algorithm to 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 do to, to do the rest of the job, I mean, to the rest of the prediction. However, the only problem is that, unlike to physics, uh, the models in biology, I mean, although we claim we know some mechanism, it's not always, you know, very uh, accurate, okay? And then uh, you might face problems of identifiability in the parameters if you don't, you know, all the mechanisms. So definitely, you can do that. I mean, I, I was doing that in a, in, a, in, a, in a problem of data augmentation. Uh, however, uh, this was, uh, as I said, uh, uh, it can be criticized in this way, you know, that the model uh, might produce artifacts. And the question is, how, that, how can you uh, remove the erroneous predictions of the model? And then, because, you know, if you, I start training my machine learning with problematic, uh, problematic uh, predictions, then uh, this will give you also wrong results. However, maybe you can see it as a well accepted noise, and then that could be okay, one case that you might uh, like it. But uh, the main criticism of this type of, at least what I was experiencing, uh, uh, this type of methods of data augmentation is uh, that the model might produce uh, artifacts and you have to have a way to uh, exclude these artifacts. Okay, yeah, thanks. Because in our case, it's much simpler. I mean, in the case I'm thinking about, we we would have only deformations, you know, so we would have a model which is showing the deformation of some um, of some structure, let's say large deformations of rubber, for example. And uh, we can simulate this using some model. And then we can also measure the deformation of a replica of this structure and and then that would be helpful when we do surgical simulation because in surgical simulation you have some rubber which in fact is the liver of some uh, patient or maybe the the brain of some other patient and you cannot measure a lot you know because you have only partial view of the scene you have only you know laparoscopic for example you have a very small hole in the body and so you don't see much and what I was wondering is whether we could pre-train the neural network in order to have uh, some sort of uh, of idea of about the types of deformations, and then when we go to the real life case, we refine basically the, the actually, training. Actually, this case that you explained me, it is a bit more. I mean, I gave you a very generic answer, but actually, your problem yeah. is much more prone. To this approach, because this is mechanics in principle, and you know a lot of mechanical properties of uh, you know of the tissues. So therefore, you can write mechanical models that they are kind of they have more global truth. Let's say so. The, it depends, let's say, on the details that the model bears or what the model tries to understand. So if I try to predict, for instance, the distribution of immune cells, this is a very complicated problem, and most of the models will give me you know. It's very difficult to judge if the model gives me a good prediction. However, in a, in a mechanical model where you use elasticity theory, things like that, I, I can't yeah. believe this has a bit more global truth. And then yeah. you can do it. I think, I think in your case, so now that you specified me the, the case study, I, I think it makes sense. But as a general uh, strategy, uh, there will be other uh, 
uh, extremities of the biological uh, details that um, you know models can give you very wrong results, and you have to be sure that you exclude them somehow. Yeah, yeah. Um, I, I completely agree. I, I, on purpose, I did not uh, tell you the first application because I wanted to to you see want to bias me. <laughs> what your general uh, what your general answer would be. Um, and then, uh, yeah, but we could talk about this for later. Well, actually, this is a very interesting thing. But honestly speaking, still there are things that w we can really predict. But I wanted to be a bit more cautious when I was talking about that, you know. That's why I yes. gave you mostly the negative aspect rather than directly the good one. Thank you. Okay, I can see maybe we have time for last question. Uh, because I can see Chandu is uh, yeah. Hi. switching on the Most camera. Thanks. Thanks to you guys for letting us attend this seminar. I mean, me and my team. Uh, but secondly, I mean, I obviously I didn't understand most of this, but that's okay. It's still educational in many forms. But my question with applying machine learning or similar algorithms, especially for the medical field, wouldn't there be issues with um, diversity in I don't know ethnicity, gene pools, or slash. Uh, what kind of preconditions people would have and how those affect things and won't there be too much um, problem in trying to um, find uh, issues and wouldn't there be a lot more uh, noise in the data and so on? I mean, just wondering. Excellent question. And actually, this is exactly the real problem of uh, applying just machine learning on things. And actually, this is why I think when IBM was trying the Watson they failed. I mean, uh, th there is so much variability between patients. So there is variability within patients, and even in the same patient, if you have, if you grow different tumors, there will be there will be variability. Or even in the same tumor, you know, the cells they are different. So uh, this is uh, this is the big problem of medicine. That's why you need huge data sets if you would like to learn something out of uh, purely about data. But the question here is that's why I'm, I'm using this kind of approach. There are some global uh, things that can be true. So, as Stefan was saying before about his problem, you know, um, deformation mechanics, either it's, a, it's an elastic band or either it's a, a tissue that has some mechanical properties, definitely they are, they are bearing some laws of physics that you can model. Right, so there the model is kind of more global truth. Also, you know, if I know, uh, let's say, a um, couple of things about the population dynamics of the cell interactions, definitely I can write things down in equations forms. So these equations, they are not. I mean, this, the, these equations encode, let's say, the principles that they are not varying across the population. The parameters can change. The structure doesn't change. Right. So this is actually the, 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 what I hope to do with this approach to encode whatever is general truth with the model and all the rest of things that they are just data that I cannot really, uh, I don't have principles or I, don't, I cannot write equations, uh, all the rest of things I will uh, use, use them in, in, in a machine learning algorithm. And there, of course, the machine learning algorithm has to take care of all the problems of noise, variability, all the, all the details that you said before. So the hope is that using this kind of um, global mechanisms that models represent, if these are true, I mean, that's again the, the big if, um, then, uh, then you can filter out some of the variability that these patients, you, you will face in these patients. So that's, that's, that's actually, that was the, the hope of the whole, and, that, and that's actually why we do this. We try to uh, get the most general properties or the most general uh, uh, principles and write equations about them. And then for the rest of the details, it's not detail, but uh, for the rest of things, we use the machine learning algorithms where actually you, they can bear all the problems that you discussed before. Okay, thank you. Welcome. All right, um, I need to close the discussion now because we are out of time now. Uh, thank you so much, Babis, for your very clear and inspiring presentation and uh, for answering our questions. Uh, I hope there will be more questions to you. Actually, you can always write me an email if you want. Like, I mean, you know, I will be really open to uh, hear your comments or questions. I'm really happy. I mean, it's, uh... thank you so much and thank you, everybody, whoever still left. 
for uh, attending the seminar today. Uh, I will keep you posted about the future seminar presentations and have a good day. Uh, Thanks a lot, Jan. Uh, good luck. Bye-bye. Bye. Thank you.